Schönen guten Tag, liebe Seherinnen und Hörer des YouTube-Kanals von International. Hier spricht wieder Fritz Zedlinger. Das ist wiederum ein kurzes Vorwort zu einem Video, das von dritter Seite produziert worden ist. Und zwar ist das wiederum mal unser Freund, unser Schweizer Freund in Japan lebend und arbeitend, Pascal Lothas, ein Politikwissenschaftler, der in Japan unterrichtet, der sehr engagiert ist, auch in Fragen der österreichischen oder insgesamt der Neutralität. Das ist auch einer unserer Beziehungspunkte. Und äh, er hat auf seinem Kanal Neutrality Studies vor wenigen Tagen ein Gespräch äh, geführt und veröffentlicht mit einem österreichischen General, mit, einem, mit einer österreichischen Persönlichkeit, mit der wir als international ebenfalls seit geraumer Zeit eng zusammenarbeiten. Es handelt sich um äh, General Günther Greindl. General Günther Greindl ist äh, war Offizier des österreichischen Bundesheeres. Er war in verschiedensten Funktionen im Landesverteidigungsministerium in Österreich tätig, darunter auch äh, vor allem in internationalen UNO-Missionen. Er war in Zypern, er war am Golan, er war im Irak und er war dann auch eine Zeit lang als UNO-Kommandant in Jugoslawien. Anschließend an seine aktive Zeit als äh, Militäroffizier war er österreichischer Diplomat gewissermaßen. Er war der, Österreich, der erste österreichische Vertreter bei der NATO. Er ist seit einigen Jahren in Pension und ist Gründer und Ehrenpräsident der Vereinigung österreichischer Peacekeeper. Das zu seiner Person. Er ist also zweifellos eine jener österreichischen Persönlichkeiten, die fast im Gegensatz äh, zu seiner Bekanntheit in Österreich eine internationale Persönlichkeit ist, der internationale Erfahrung hat, der bei wichtigen internationalen Einsätzen und Projekten tätig war. Warum äh, wir auch als international mit ihm seit einiger Zeit enger zusammenarbeitet, hat einen ganz aktuellen innern europapolitischen ähm, Hintergrund, nämlich die österreichische Neutralität. Günter Greindl, aufgrund seiner jahrzehntelangen internationalen Erfahrung als Peacekeeper, ist inzwischen einer der äh, wirklich am aktivsten und am klarsten seine Position öffentlich auch darlegender Österreicher, der sich vehement und bedingungslos für die österreichische Neutralität einsetzt. Sie wissen, ihr wisst vielleicht, dass nicht zuletzt aufgrund dieses unsäglichen Ukraine-Kriegs auch die Frage der Neutralität als internationales Instrument auch eben nicht unmittelbar in Konflikte hineingezogen zu werden, an Bedeutung und auch an Vehemenz gewonnen hat und das von vielen Seiten her in Wirklichkeit die Position vertreten wird. Die Ukraine ist ja ein Beweis dafür, dass Neutralität einfach kein Weg ist, dass Neutralität eben kein Mechanismus und kein Instrument ist, das ein Land, eine Region vor Aggression schützt. Und gerade diese Diskussion wird auch jetzt in Österreich heftig geführt und Günter Greindl ist einer der klaren Sprecher für die Beibehaltung der Neutralität, was nicht bedeutet, dass man die österreichische Neutralität, die aus dem Jahr 1955 ähm, stammt, 
modernisieren, den heutigen Zeiten anpassen sollte, aber nicht abbauen oder noch äh, in Wirklichkeit abschaffen. Das ist seine Position und das ist auch das Thema, das uns vereint. Und äh, Pascal Lauters hat natürlich in dem Gespräch auch die Frage der Neutralität äh, besprochen, aber er hat mit Kreindl in Wirklichkeit aufgrund dessen jahrzehntelanger internationalen Erfahrungen auch einen Tour d'Horizon ähm, durchgeführt und hat also eine Reihe von aktuellen und auch historischen internationalen Konflikten besprochen. In diesem Sinn ist das ein Gespräch, das äh, viele verschiedene Themen anschneidet, ich halte es für interessant, ich halte es für wichtig, sich das aus äh, anzuhören und vor allem, ich, ich, ich halte es für bemerkenswert, dass eben äh, zu Recht eine österreichische Persönlichkeit wie Günter Greindl auch äh, durch dieses Gespräch einem internationalen Publikum in Erinnerung gebracht wird und vorgestellt wird. Aus diesem Grund ist dieses Gespräch auch in englischer Sprache äh, durchgeführt worden. Für jene, die lieber trotzdem äh, Texte in Deutsch dann äh, äh, hören oder zumindest sehen können, möchte ich darauf verweisen, dass jeder von euch, je nach genauer Konfiguration des Computers und des Laptops, aber irgendwo meistens am unteren Rand des Bildes, eine Funktion äh, hat, wo man jede be beliebige Sprache auswählen, dann sich zumindest Untertitel zu einem Video, zu einem Gespräch eben einschalten kann. Also wer nicht nur hören Englisch, sondern auch Deutsch mitlesen möchte, der möge diese Funktion am Beginn des Videos einschalten und kann dann in deutscher Sprache lesen, was in Englisch gesprochen wird. In diesem Sinn herzlichen Dank äh, für die Aufmerksamkeit und ich glaube, äh, das folgende Gespräch ist es wirklich wert, gehört zu werden. In diesem Sinn, bis zum nächsten Mal. Auf Wiedersehen. Hello everybody, this is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you today General Günther Greindl. General Greindl is an Austrian military expert in peacekeeping who's holding a master's degree in civil engineering and political science. Among other positions, he served as the commander of the United Nations Force in Cyprus from 1981 to 89 and as an inspector general for the United Nations Protection Force. In the year 2000, he became the first Austrian military representative to the European Union and to NATO. In 2002, he was promoted to the rank of general. He is the founding president of the Association of Austrian Peacekeepers. General Greindl, thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, thank, thank you for the invitation, yes. So, General, I wanted to talk to you because you wrote several articles that were critical about uh, Austria's role in um, in these European security affairs, and you are an expert on peacekeeping. So can we maybe start with peacekeeping more generally. What exactly is it? How is peacekeeping different from uh, military interventions? And what has Austria's role or wh what was the role of neutral states so far in peacekeeping operations? Well, during the Cold War, of course, the peacekeeping operations were authorized by the United Nations, by the Security Council. At that time, the United Nations Security Council still was working. Now, of course, you know, it's blocked. So it will be difficult, presumably, to find uh, a mandate for peacekeeping operations. But the important thing is that uh, peacekeeping operations are authorized by the Security Council and therefore are different from a military intervention. They are um, geared to, um, to promote understanding between the two parties to, of course, separate them. This is one of the big issues, but to, to uh, try to build trust. And peacekeeping does not um, moralize, so to speak, you know, does not uh, um, uh, judge uh, parties who is right, who is wrong, 
but tries uh, to establish uh, journals again, to build trust, and of course, uh, to prevent uh, the recurrence of, of uh, fighting. And uh, there are different methods, you know, there are areas of separation, which you can establish, you can position troops, uh, interblocking positions, and there are various techniques, you know, which you use uh, in, in peacekeeping operations. But the important thing is, you know, there was one famous um, uh, statement in a in a British newspaper once about peacekeeping, where they said, you know, peacekeeping is not a job for soldiers, but only soldiers can do it, you know, mm -hmm. because it has both elements. It has the element of diplomacy and has the element of uh, military uh, deployment. Right? The interesting thing about peacekeeping in the United Nations is that the UN was originally not designed to do peacekeeping. It's uh, something that came on top uh, only later, um, I think in the context of the Korean War, in order to, to separate the two, it was kind of ad hoc added to the uh, to the, the the mandates of the of the United Nations. Now, um, why is it that you, as a as a soldier from a neutral country, were then also able to participate in those uh, in in those missions? Are peacekeepers or peacekeeping when it works? Is it itself a form of a a neutral way of mediation? Yes, because. Uh... If you deploy forces between two uh, opposing parties, yes, between uh, in a conflict, then of course it is very important that these troops which are interposed, uh, they are accepted by both parties. They are seen as not being hostile. And this is the reason why uh, during the Cold War period, you know, the neutral countries were basically those countries which provided the soldiers for peacekeeping operations was Finland, Sweden, Ireland, um, uh, Austria, of course, or countries, you know, there were, of course, uh, was one very important NATO country, or two, actually, who had also been part of peacekeeping operations, which was Norway and Canada. But uh, they had a different kind of policy, you know, they were not involved in this uh, sort of conflicts, you know. So, um, for me, it was very interesting, for instance, when we were um, uh, deployed on the Golan Heights. Uh, this was, of course, between Syria and Israel. And this was 10 years after the end of uh, World War II. So the Israelis were rather critical about uh, Austrian troops you know, being deployed on the Golan Heights. Uh, but the UN said, look, the Austrians are neutral, so what is your problem? And the Israelis accepted, said, yes, they are now a neutral country, so we can accept them as peacekeeping uh, force in, in uh, between Israel and Syria. And it's quite interesting that when the Austrians left you know, this mission, the Israeli uh, regretted it very much and said, look, the Austrians were the backbone of this mission, so we are very sorry that they are leaving. So this is, there you see that uh, neutrality is a very important aspect uh, for uh, operations, uh, peacekeeping operations, of course, because um, it is important how the parties perceive these uh, deployed troops, you know. It, uh, be because, uh, you know, when, 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 when you are... Uh, when you have a hostile attitude, you are not uh, suitable for peacekeeping operations, of course. You, know. you need to be accepted by both parties so that none of them... You have to be people. accepted by both parties as being seen impartial. Uh, or not for... I, and I'm going to ask you now a question that is purely hypothetical because the war in Ukraine is still ongoing. But from your experience as somebody who was a peacekeeper... Who do you think could play that role at the moment? Or like if fighting was to cease, who could be a peacekeeper in Ukraine if ever we get to the negotiation stage? Well, this is a very difficult question to answer. I, don't, I, I think, you know, that presumably a way out of this war would be some uh, ceasefire with uh, an interposing peacekeeping force. You know? And then, of course, it's very important who would be suitable. This is your question. So I think, of course, that uh, you, 
countries of the European Union would not be readily accepted. So, so we have to turn presumably to Latin America, Asian countries, African countries. Austria would be accepted if they would follow a, a policy of neutrality. You know? And uh, I regret very much that we... Um, we we are not a, a voice of peace in this conflict, you know, because uh, I think for a permanent neutral country like Austria, it would be very important to be always a voice of peace. I'm from Switzerland, and Switzerland neither. We there's no there's no. Uh, no Switzerland, I think Switzerland would be acceptable. You know, I think uh, no Swiss Switzerland. Switzerland is already very much engaged with, uh, in in the Ukraine, so the Red Cross, you know. And they are doing a very, very, very good job there. So I think, yes, and Switzerland is not a member of the EU, so Poisonover would be acceptable. How about the Indians? India has quite a bit India, of peacekeeping yes. capacity. India. 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 No, India is a very, a very important point you raise because India has a long tradition of peacekeeping. You know, India was in the in the Congo, you know, was the largest force there. And I, and I had uh, very often Indian troops under my command, you know, and they're re really professional soldiers. And they have always followed a non-aligned policy. So they, I think, they would be, uh, maybe they would, all, would be even the main body of a peacekeeping force like that, you know. And they're being courted at the moment by both sides, right? The Russians as yes. much as the Europeans yes. and Americans, they would we'll both like to have the Indians on their side yes. and they're not picking sides. No, they're, they're not. They're, they are not really taking a side, you know, and, and India, you know, when you, when you look at the, at the, um, at the Indian Pakistan mission, you know, there are these principles which have been at that time already in 1948 laid down by India and Pakistan for, for peacekeeping operations. So ha they have a real tradition in, in a kind of um, um, organizing interposing forces. You know? So I think they would be a very, a very important partner if, if something like that would be established in the Ukraine. Yes, I, I agree with that. I would very much like to 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 see that come through. Just also for the fact that we we would need somebody, actually a force, probably in Ukraine, a third party force, in order to make sure that that um, these these two sides would be separated. Because we saw, unfortunately, what happened with the Minsk agreement that was not externally enforced, and it it never it never became anything. Do you think the Minsk agreement could have benefited from actual peacekeeping? Well, the, the, the Minsk agreement, unfortunately, is a failure, you know, was a failure, is a failure. And um, I, you could now look at it, who is responsible that the Minsk uh, agreement failed, you know. But I think that those who negotiated the agreement were not uh, following up. Uh, uh, they, they were happy with the agreement and then lost, uh, so to speak, interest really to follow up with political actions. And yes, uh, Minsk agreement, I think, is dead. So it will, will, will be not, cannot be revived. We have now a different situation. The Minsk agreement would have been something maybe in, in March, uh, uh, 2022, and there was this first uh, negotiations between Russia and Ukraine. But I think that now the situation has gone beyond that, and and uh, so we, we we are faced with a new new challenge here, and one would have to negotiate a different kind of uh, ceasefire. Right. Um, let me maybe move forward to a question about the European Union. So Austria is a neutral country inside the EU. Austria is therefore also bound to the common security and defense policy. And um, Europe or the EU, the EU has recently introduced several policy vehicles that I think are quite problematic to a neutral country like Austria. Uh, one is the so-called peace facility, 
which I really find very Orwellian named because what the peace facility does is because the EU budget itself cannot be used to fuel any conflicts. It's forbidden by the by the way the EU is founded. The, an external budget was created that is not under the, uh, the standard EU rules where states can give money to, including Austria. And then from that pot of money, you pay for everything from humanitarian aid to Ukraine up until up to weapons and shells and so on that, that are then bought on the international market and given to Ukraine. Now, this peace facility strikes me as a big problem to a to a neutral like Austria. The second thing is the idea of this rapid response force that recently came up and that the EU is about to build, which really looks like an EU army to me, although it now has a very different name. Um, what do you make of, the, of these two developments in the EU? Well, the, the peace facility was originally, uh, the idea that was created was to help Africa because uh, the Africans always said, we have uh, we have uh, troops, but we don't have the equipment, you know, we don't have the money. And so uh, the idea was to help uh, particularly the African Union for beekeeping operations in Africa. Now it has taken a different, <laughs> a different turn. Uh, well, this is a development. I do not want to comment whether whether it's a good or bad, but it, it's a it's a fact, you know. And as far as it comes to this rapid response for uh, response force or the uh, battle groups, right, which we have since a long time, which have been by the way never de deployed, you know, which is quite interesting because uh, to deploy this battle group you would, uh, is a very difficult decision making process necessary. I mean, the battle groups had, of course, an advantage, and Austria has taken part, and I'm I'm really um, for it that we take part because it ha they have a the big advantage of uh, being a training ground, you know, for multinational forces, and this this they have delivered. But now, to deploy a, a battle group like that, I think the EU can only do this under a UN mandate. If there would not be a, a mandate from the Security Council, it would be a failure. You know, and and therefore, you know, I have no problems if the Austrians take part in these battle groups, uh, because uh, they are they are meant for deployment abroad for peacekeeping operations. You know, this would be the ideal uh, the ideal group for a peacekeeping operation if it would be accepted, because under a UN Security uh, Council mandate, they could be deployed for these kind of operations. So. Uh but they don't have but don't have any any other significance in my opinion you know this is 5000 uh, troops so this is, uh, doesn't have any it, it's part of of an effort you know to coordinate the military military training in the in, in the in the eu but isn't there isn't there a danger that this um that this nucleus that's being created now as a as a battle group that that could be expanded and that it could be used offensively because we have seen this already happening with nato nato was supposed to be a defensive force right only if attacked it would respond and then we saw suddenly the idea emerge uh, out of area or out of business and the nato troops went all the way to afghanistan and they were they they were used to attack uh belgrade and nato forces bombed libya um i am quite a you know i know you're a military man but i'm quite afraid of militaries because once you have them isn't there always the 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 the, the danger that suddenly politicians get the idea we should use them if we already have them Yes, of course you have a point, but uh, there's a big difference between uh, NATO and the EU. You know, NATO has uh, has a partner which is uh, which has the potential to deploy and support uh, military troops. You know, and this without the United States, you know, NATO would not be able also to deploy any troops anywhere. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, and the EU will not be without the support of of, uh, of the United States will not be in a position to deploy troops anywhere. You know, rather than a peacekeeping operations, and then you must uh, understand. You know, there are five, six nations involved to form this battle group. You know, which is always a, 
a ruling uh, participation. And so you need uh, five parliaments or five, five, five governments, you know, to agree to such a, a deployment, which is very difficult. And where's the logistic support, you know? So I don't see this, uh, this danger, you know, I see, I see these battle groups. This would be an ideal force, you know, to support United Nations for peacekeeping operations. Remember, we had once this effort of Sherbrooke. I know whether this is means something to you. This was a Danish initiative, you know, a stand by high readiness brigade, you know, to form the, the EU, where the EU countries formed a stand by high readiness brigade was meant to support uh, the UN, you know, in case of peacekeeping operations. Actually, the battle groups would be this ideal mm -hmm. uh, military unit to do that, you know. So let's see how, the, how, 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 how things go, you know. But I think that, um, that uh, in the long run, uh, you know, the EU must rethink its, its policy. You know, the EU, the EU is not a, a military force. You know, the EU was created for different purposes. You know, the EU was created to be a force of, of trade, you know, of peace, and uh, in fully in, in line with the UN Charter, you know. And, uh, so we'll see how, what development the EU will take, you know, in the wake of, of this new, uh, searching uh, war, war in, 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 in Europe, you know, we are going back, we are going 30 years back to Cold War. Uh, uh, and this cannot be in the interest of, of Europe. Uh, I had a I had a talk with uh, um, Ambassador Chas Freeman, a uh, US uh, um, a diplomat, and he was making the argument that we are not going to look back to the Cold War. We are going back to the 19th century, where you just have different groups of countries, and they are, they will not they are not uh, afraid anymore to use military force in order to 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 achieve political aims. Um, because what we are seeing now is that you can even have a conventional war with a nuclear uh, power. And well, there you go. You've got soldiers on the ground, boots on the ground, and they fight each other. It's quite sad. It's very sad. So in, in that context, my question would be like, what can the EU do in order to keep that dynamic down? Like, how, how do we get back to um, to diplomacy instead of warfare? Yeah, but in reality, well, we, we are already in a Cold War, you know, what, what is the Cold War? The Cold War is uh, that you keep it uh, below the nuclear uh, uh, level, you know, but the Cold War is you have no communications, you don't, uh, you, you, you have a line, you know, which you're going to cross, you have an enemy, you know, you, you don't understand your interests, uh, common interests are not uh, anymore valuable, you know, so you have your own, uh, each group has its own view of the world, so to speak, you know, there's no, 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 no common uh, understanding anymore. And this is already there, you know, so uh, I think what we, we will see a, a new iron curtain in, in Europe, you know, if you, if, if Russia is part of Europe, you know, is it Russia part of Europe? You know, this is now Debatable over also, you know. So um, I think that um, to overcome this, it will be very difficult. But uh, we all must work, you know, for for peace. And uh, this is what is my my point. You know, I miss the voices for peace. You know, we, we have only voices for war and confrontation. You know, and I miss the voices for peace because. Um, a voice for peace will we will first look at what are the interests. What are our own interests? What are the interests of the United States? What are the interests of Russia, you know? And then try to to come to some understanding what can be done, you know, to accommodate this interest and come to a common uh, approach, you know, like, like we had in the 90s and in the, uh, also in the OSC, you know, this, this was the keystone uh, development of the OSC, the common and indivisible security, you know, this, this, this vision, we have lost this vision, you know. We, that but we have security is of of our common is a common interest of all of us. This vision we have lost. We have thrown that vision out, right? That vision is something that was actively rejected by um, by the West because the Russians yeah. have said over and over again, 
uh, we want yeah. to negotiate the, the, the security yeah. structure in Europe. Um, or, or do you see, uh, because I think it was the West that did the mistake that should have said, yes, Russia, let's sit down, let's have mm -hmm. a, a security conference and let's do with Ukraine what happened with Austria back in 55, because that plot of land should obviously be neutral, should obviously not belong to anyone uh, except to itself. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Of course, you know, if you look at, uh, and this is why I think that neutrality <clears throat> is an important um, keystone for peace and security. Uh, because um, we are now discussing in Austria neutrality uh, only under the aspect of, of security. This is, of course, not the whole story. You know, I think we have to distinguish between a temporary neutrality or permanent neutrality. You know? Permanent neutrality is more than only about security. Temporary neutrality is basically about security. You know, these are these buffer states which have been created and so on. You know, they are, and Sweden, for instance, and Finland, of course, they were never permanent neutral. You know, and they were non-aligned states. So, but a permanent neutral state like Austria, this is more than than than. Uh, uh, the as or, or comprises more than the aspect of security. It's it's an attitude. It's an attitude towards peace, you know. And this is what I'm missing, and this is why I'm concerned, and this is why I'm trying to to at least um, make uh, make this again a point of discussion. You know, that we need um, also in the EU, you know, um, governments and states. Who are not following uh, this logic of war? You know, who, I mean, you don't need, of course, to to oppose uh, actions which the EU is is uh, is trying to do. But but at least you have to make to you have to make a po a few points, you know, and find the right time and the right language, you know, to also um, speak about what can be done to end a war and not to continue it, you know. How is it that you, as a military man, are so much in favor of a of a diplomatic uh, way out? I mean, the the uh, this is. I think I I would not understand the, the the answer to that, but I would like to hear hear it from you. Why is it that you, as a military man, are are so much ag against the use of military force? Because I've seen, I've been in many conflicts, you know, and I've seen that uh, that war is basically destruction, you know, and achieves in the most time achieves nothing. At the end, you know, you have to come to uh, a settlement and to a, a solution. And sometimes, you know, war is fought for for, for reasons for uh, which are really not so important, you know. I mean, is it is it really so important whether whether uh, Ukraine is 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 a neutral country or a part of NATO. You know, is 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 this the key to a solution, right? So I think if you have a common understanding and and try to and try to uh, analyze also the conflicts, the reasons for a conflict. You know, because only if you look at how a conflict is, developed, you know, a war is always at the end of a process of a conflict which could have been stopped if people would have been more reasonable in the first place you know and this uh, with this idea you know then you you find that the war is a war is not the solution you know and uh, and now we see you know what about would be the end of war the ukraine would be uh, a, a country destructed you know will be uh, um, a lot of damage is done a lot of dead people you know soldiers die and for what reason? You know, we could have. Uh, I think there, there sh should be a possibility to find the solutions if we have um, the common interests in mind. You know, as it was part of the of the cooperative security of the OSE, and yep. you know, a key point. This is the key point of cooperative security. You know? Cooperative security has always two winners. You know. If you have a, 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 an opposing force, you know, then one wants, one side wants to win, you know, and wants to be the victor, you know. But in a cooperative security, 
you you try to accommodate both sides. You know, this is the difference. People who oppose what you're saying would immediately argue, but general. Obviously, Vladimir Putin doesn't want peace. Obviously, obviously, he wants war because he's evil, because he's an imperialist, because he wants to build, rebuild the Soviet Union. And he, this person only understands the language of war in order to stop him. What do you pl reply to these people? Yeah, it's, 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 the question is: the question is, is it is it really the truth which we are telling? You know, no, it's are not. We, uh, have, have we ever talked? Have we ever talked with? Uh, if if you cut all channels, you know, and never talk with the opposing, um, with the opposing force or with the enemy, so to speak. You know, you can, you are not really knowing what what he wants. You know, I mean, you could of course quote other. Um, uh, other attitudes of Putin, you know, I mean, in 2001, he was applauded, you know, in the Bundestag, you know, or, or in 2007 at the, at the Munich security um, uh, conference, you know, he already, you know, warned uh, we are going the wrong way if we are not building trust between us, uh, be between us and so on, you know. So it is very difficult, you know, w w what is really in his mind, I, I don't know, you know. But on the other hand, where's the proof that he really wants to to attack Europe or so? You know, what? Where is 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 it really realistic? I I don't know. You know, I think uh, we would know if we would uh, find a way to talk to each other. You know? Now, the I mean, my answer would be that Putin and, and the Russians have been uh, negotiating the whole time for eight years the Minsk agreements, and for eight years between fourteen until twenty two, this was this was negotiation the whole time, the whole entire time, and even at the end of March we had negotiations. My point would be no negotiations were constantly sabotaged by um by the by western forces and constantly constantly the Rus russians were lied to but um maybe we don't have to go that far let me ask you about another uh topic um the one that we came together in the first place to uh today sky uh, let, let me just say one thing because it comes to my mind now what you said you know uh can we what could we know if uh, what putin wants why are we not asking? You, know, you had this African peace mission, mm -hmm. and he was waving with this document, you know, mm -hmm. which was signed. He said, "Look, we had that agreement. Here are the signatures." Why are we not asking Putin and say, "Show us this document. Is it true? Is this is this what you were waving with this document? Is this a fake document, or is it really true that the Ukrainians signed uh, this agreement, which was an agreement which was very reasonable if 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 you look at it, you know? So, but, so you know, what I want to say is, that we have broken all communications. We are not talking to each, to each other anymore. And this is the problem. And, and we know he would because your chancellor, Nehammer, he went and met Putin a year ago. He was the first yeah. Western leader to meet him. And he, and Putin said, yes, if you want to come to Moscow, come. Yeah. So um, it wouldn't be but impossible. It, Takes a phone call. No. Okay, but uh, you had another question, right? Yeah, I had a question about Sky Shield. So the Germans a year ago yeah. came up with the idea of creating a common European yes. um, radar system, basically, in order to defend against incoming missiles from who could it be, like probably the Russians, right? And they asked Austria and Switzerland to join. And actually, both governments last month signed a memorandum of understanding saying, like, yeah, we want to join. Um, could you explain to me a bit more what, what Sky Shield exactly is, how it's supposed to work, and what you think about Austrian and Swiss cooperation in this scheme? What Sky Shield is and how it's going to work, you know, I cannot tell you, you know, because everybody is saying, uh, we have signed this agreement because uh, we don't know what how it's developed and we want to be from the beginning there to know how it's developed and to can can influence it you know so obviously you know some people are saying it's only a community for um, for common uh, purchases you know to have uh, better prices uh, on the market you know? uh, but if you look at uh, uh, if if you look at sky sky shield as i think it's designed you know it was intended is of course 
uh, protection against uh, missile attacks on Europe, you know. And uh, if that is the case, you know, then everybody, it's clear that, you know, for a neutral country, it will be very difficult to participate there, you know, because then you are part of, of, of an alliance, you know, this is quite obvious, you know. So we really don't know how this uh, Sky Shield initiative uh, will develop. It's quite interesting that many countries are not, uh, European countries are not part of it. You know, France is not part of it, Poland is not part of it, Italy, Bulgaria, Romania. So it's, it's, uh, we, I, I think it's too early to say how this thing develops. But what I was saying and what my uh, assessment is, it's the logic of the Cold War again, you know, back to the Cold War. And it's the start of a new arms race. And this is the problem, you know. We will invest lots of money and we will have a perceived security, which will always be a security under threat of attack, you know. Instead of going another track, you know, is to have a cooperative security, you know, which we were trying to build uh, in the 90s and up to year, uh, year 2014, it worked, you know. So, um, Therefore, there, therefore, I think this uh, Sky Shield initiative will not uh, will at the end not not really protect Europe. You know, it, if 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 we uh, will have a war in Europe, it's impossible to protect against uh, missile attacks and you know, of hypersonic uh, missiles. You know. The, the, the area is too big, you know, you would, you would, uh, presumably need hundreds of Patriot uh, batteries, you know, to protect uh, Europe really from missile attacks, you know. And then it's an arms race. So, so if, if, if there is the, the sense that there is a protection, of course, the uh, Russians will develop something which will break this uh, shield and then they, have to start again, you know, to develop something which will be again a protection against a certain weapon. So we are back to the arms race, and this is the problem, you know. Right. And what we are seeing at the moment is that even uh, neutral countries in Europe are willing to just, in the idea of an arms race, to participate in that in that idea, right? Yes. From yeah, it's it's surprising for me. Surprising that Austria and Switzerland uh, are among the first uh, the states uh, signing up for this, at least for this um, uh, declaration. Under the, uh, I think the the justification is we need to be informed, right? So we need to know what's going on, and we cannot uh, protect ourselves alone, you know. Quite, quite uh, interesting, you know, Israel can do that, you know, so why could we do that if we really want it? But I, I see the point, you know, uh, but the information we can also get, you know, if, if you look at the joint uh, European NATO declaration of January 23, you know, there is a point uh, in it, you know, which quite clearly says that non-NATO uh, nations of the EU should be informed of of, um, of what's going on in NATO, you know, as far as their security is concerned. So I think uh, that we would have uh, also other ways of being informed what's going on in, in Sky Shield. And also my point was, why why need we to go First, you know, why don't we see, uh, wait and see how things develop? Maybe we will have, could also be that we have a kind of armistice in, in, in six months or in a year's time in Ukraine, and maybe we will have negotiations between the United States and Russia again, you know, uh, and we will have a peacekeeping force. So, you know, we'll, there will be a lot of developments, but we want to follow this logic now. Russia is the eternal enemy, and therefore we have to go back to the logic of Cold War. Yeah, and it's a lot, and it's the logic of war. You know, I keep I keep reminding my friends that the best defense is not having an enemy, um, because it's quite funny how the Europeans are so focused on 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 Russia, saying Russia is obviously so evil and such a danger, and China is so evil and such a danger. And then I talked to a Mongolian diplomat. 
And Mongolia is sandwiched between Russia and China. And I asked him, aren't you afraid of, of Russia? And he looked at me bewildered and said, no, we have no problems with the Russians. They're not threatening us. The Chinese neither. There's no problem. We 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 have a cooperative uh, arrangement with both of them. We're fine. It's <laughs> quite quite amazing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but but you you make a very important point. You know, uh, if you have uh, an alliance, you need an enemy. Otherwise, the alliance falls apart. You know, yep. and uh, you if you look at the development of, of of NATO, you know, when when the Soviet Union broke down, you know, NATO was in real trouble. You know, they didn't yeah. know we dissolve it or what are we going to do. You know, and um, and then, of course, there was this out of area concept, you know, which gave it a little bit of uh, of a new task, you know. But then they found out this is not so easy, you know. So uh, we will not be able to have NATO uh, being the policeman of the whole world. And and now, of course, they have the enemy uh, again. And uh, and but the the point is exactly, you know, we're coming back to the same. Uh, idea which we already discussed if you lose your channels of communication you know if you don't if you don't analyze and accept what are interests of 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 the different partners of a cooperative security arrangement that if you don't, uh, don't accept that only um how can i say only a balance of interests you know mm. will will guarantee a stable situation you know uh, then of course you you end up always with having an enemy, and you need an enemy, you know, yeah. because otherwise you cannot justify all these expenses, you know. So it is very we, we are we we are at the merging of of a new world order. I think you know. I I think that uh, the hegemony of uh, United States may last another twenty or thirty years, you know, but cannot last forever because a hegemony always. Um, it, we will always be challenged by those, you know, who are under, under threat of this hegemony, you know. And it's only a question of time until they are strong enough to, to get rid of it, you know. And uh, and the better the better project would be, you know, to find a common um, understanding and a balance of interests, you know. This would be the better way. And this Funny. is what we had. This is what we had. In the nineties and in the years early two thousands, and we lost it. And we should make really, we should really think and have a strong uh, incentive. Why, why did it go wrong? And what can we do that we, when we are able to establish something like similar again, which I think should be the goal, what could we do that it doesn't go wrong then? Yeah, it's quite fascinating. Like the the U.S. and Europe won yeah. the Cold War and then lost the peace. We literally yes. lost the structures that we had in order to have peace. We lost. Um, it's such a European thing to do because the Europeans, we Europeans keep doing that again and again and again. Yes. Yeah, you are right. You know, Europe, Europe was the battlefield, you know, for six, seven hundred years, you know, since the Roman times, actually, Europe was always a battlefield. And then we won this Cold War and we had this idea of be having a peaceful Europe, uh, you know, which is only, in my view, able to have also peace with Russia. You know, if you don't have peace with Russia, if you don't have peace with Russia, you will not have a peaceful Europe, you know, mm -hmm. this, uh, the proof is now again here. And, um, and I think that we don't have enough, um, how can I say, politicians or, or, or enough um, uh, support for for the idea of what do we need to do to get rid of being Europe the battlefield of the world all the time, you know. Because now we if 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 the escalation continues, we will have again in Europe we have already this structure in Ukraine, you know. I mean we are using cluster bombs in, in Ukraine, you know, we are we are dispersing them in European territory, you know. This is insane, you know. So, but, yeah, it's the logic of war, you know. A war, as Clausen said, war is always um, uh, moving towards the extreme, yeah. you know. And, and this is why I, why I say, you know, we need a different voice. We need voices of peace in order to stop uh, this escalation to the extreme, you know. 
Yeah, and I would like to re um, reiterate my my plea to Indian and African friends: please help us Europeans not to kill ourselves because that's what we keep doing. Yeah. Um, General Grindel, um, thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for the talk. I hope to talk to you soon again. Yes, and thank you. You know, and uh, yeah, let let's see what happens. You know, we would be very surprised, maybe. You don't know, you know, the future, we, we cannot tell the future and we don't know. Maybe in a year we are sitting here and talking about who should take part in the peacekeeping force in the Ukraine. Who knows? You know. Hopefully, hopefully. hopefully. General Grindel, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye.